the long-term vision was just quite simply to connect the historical archive of photographs, to connect it with the present day city in a new way using new technology so that all these old photographs could somehow be connected with the actual places in the city instead of be connected with the history museum building. Jeffrey Allen Rhodes is a Shanghai-based artist and filmmaker working to connect the real and virtual world through his virtual reality and augmented reality works. Originally from the United States, Rhodes, now 48 years old, moved to China in the summer of 2020. He became a professor at the Institute of Cultural and Creative Industry, a joint project of Shanghai Jiao Tong University and the University of Southern California. While cultivating talents for the next generation, the middle-aged professor himself has been exploring new possibilities in his own career by tapping into the rich historical heritages of China. I've been putting together partnerships here in Shanghai, talking with the Shanghai Library and their archives, developing projects along the famous set of buildings on the Bund. Right now we're looking at VR projects, VR publications, big city, there's a lot of different projects you can imagine doing in Shanghai, but this is a place where we've started. Interested in hearing more about this artist? And what does this VR and AR work actually look like? Yin Cho Chi found out more in their conversation. You're from the United States. Could you talk about your experience in your home country? Where did you grow up? And how did you study to become an artist and a filmmaker? Yeah, I grew up in the United States. I went to high school and undergraduate and college in Seattle, Washington, which at the time in the 90s was very culturally important in the United States. And I was involved in the music community and also the filmmaking community. I made a few feature films and documentaries and later became involved in the art gallery scene. This is the late 90s, early 2000s, when technology was really moving into the art gallery. More screens were moving into the gallery, and I was involved in that movement, with video art and early computer art in the art gallery. At the time, I was studying in Buffalo, New York, and then later Toronto, beginnings of augmented reality and virtual reality. This was around the time that the iPhone came out, 2007, 2008. I started working with different artists that would publish things for iPhones or try to use the new smartphones to share experiences with public to make a new way that you could publish interactive art, especially augmented reality. Then uh, I joined the faculty in Chicago at the Art Institute of Chicago. And it was there over the last 10, 12 years that I started to become more involved with virtual reality and kind of followed that trend as virtual reality grew a lot with the new technologies and new ways to publish it with devices and smartphones. It was also there in Chicago that I began working with the Chicago History Museum and using their archive of historical photography to publish these types of new media history experiences for audiences in the city. So could you tell us the uh, production process of those works you have done with the Chicago History Museum? For these works, I worked directly with uh, an executive there at the museum, and we collaborated directly looking at this archive of several million photographs of the city where there were special opportunities to tell a story in a new way or to let people see these images in a new way. And so we identify places in the city where many photographs have been taken because of a particular event. Our first experiments we would do just in the downtown streets, uh, State Street, Madison, in the very center of downtown. This is still an active commercial street, but it was an active commercial street in 1870, 1880, uh, very beginning of the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, some of the very first films, Edison films of the city, so about as old as films get, were shot on that street on street corners, early photographs, 3D photographs, uh, panoramic photographs. Our first real project we did near there along the river in the downtown core of the city and a particular event that happened in 1915 on April 15th. There were hundreds of photographs of this ship that had sunk there as well as some very early films. 
And we use these to create an augmented reality experience where someone who was in downtown could download the app standing there in the same place where these photographers stood 100 years ago. They could see those photographs in the exact spot where they're taken along the river, on the bridges, on the side of the river, and learn more about the story of what had happened so long ago. That was published in 2016. And then every year after that, we would publish a different project. Some St. Valentine's Day massacre on the north side of the city, famous gangland event in 1929. We did the following year, 1933 World's Fair, Century of Progress World's Fair along the lake in the city. We did one around that event. 1893 World's Fair down by the University of Chicago on the south side of the city. We did one. 1968 Democratic National Convention and the events around that was recently a subject of a big motion picture. We did that. Also, the 1871 Great Chicago Fire, very famous, uh, did one around that. So every year we would do one. And we started moving more into virtual reality productions. This would involve taking virtual reality cameras and shooting the site in the present day and matching it with photographs from history. So a lot of times, like we did it for the 1893 World's Fair. So photographs from over 100 years ago where people in 1893 maybe took a camera, an early camera, and they traveled up in the original Ferris wheel by the University of Chicago, which at that time was one of the tallest things in the world, the original Ferris wheel. And they shot pictures out of the windows. And then so we sent up a drone and we did VR photography and matched the exact location to present day where these photographs were taken so long ago. So these projects are exciting both because people don't get to see these photographs very much. They're just in the archive, but there's no book or movie in which they might see them. And mm-hmm. so they're seeing them for the first time. And then also to match them with present day, to match these images that are about as old as images get. You don't get that much older than 1893. Mm -hmm. And to match it with uh, these locations in the present day that people are familiar with, like the University of Chicago or Jackson Park along the lake or these different places. People know these places, but they've never seen the history that occurred there so long ago. So the experience you have brought to the viewers and users is so fresh through these VR and AR productions. So generally, how have your works been received? You know, not only has new technology changed how we can see pictures, you know, that we can see it in virtual reality or see it in augmented reality, but it's also changed the way things are distributed or how Mm -hmm. people find them. And so for these projects, we were able to share the content in many different ways, not just one different way. For example, we would publish all these VR photographs of all these different sites matched with historical photographs. And then we'd also put up a site where you could explore it through kind of a maps interface, sort of Google Maps type thing. And then we would also put it up a VR video with narration where you could watch it as sort of a VR movie and all these different ways that someone could experience it. So this helped the audience be much larger than it might be otherwise. I think across these projects and platforms, we had over 3 million viewers, which is pretty large for a city history project. What was great about the project is it had a real long-term vision. The long-term vision was just quite simply to connect the historical archive of photographs, to connect it with the present-day city in a new way using new technology so that all these old photographs could somehow be connected with the actual places in the city instead of be connected with the history museum building. So you're standing on a street corner and you can see that things connected with that street corner. This was always the overall goal. Now let's take a short break. When we come back, Rhodes will talk about the reasons why he moved to China, his teaching and artistic creations at the Shanghai Jiao Tong University and more. Stay tuned. You've been listening to Footprints, When was your first trip to China as a tourist? I first visited China in 2010 because my wife come to work at the Spanish Pavilion, actually. We weren't married back then, but we were dating. And she had grown up in Shanghai and her family was in Shanghai. But we met at the State University of New York, Buffalo Graduate School. 
And in 2010, with the expo, she had an opportunity to come back to Shanghai to work at the Spanish Pavilion in media. So she was part of that. And so I came and visited in the summer when I was on break from school to see her and to also see the 2010 expo, which was very impressive. So that was my first trip to China and my first trip to Shanghai as well. Oh. How about your impression of the city? Certainly part of my impression was wrapped around 2010 Expo just changed Shanghai a lot. And the Shanghai got really prepared for this big influx of tourists, both tourists in China and tourists from outside of China for mm -hmm. the 2010 Expo. And I said, came at that moment and was part of that, you know, the crowds at the Expo and uh, the new technology there and all the little English signs and the taxi cabs, right, which I think was part of Expo, actually. Mm -hmm. And But I was surprised by how much it reminded me of America in a way, yeah. in the sense that Shanghai was a very big city with very big roads and big sidewalks and a lot of space, which reminded me some of Chicago. So I think that surprised me. At the time, did you ever consider that one day you would move to Shanghai and live in the city? Well, we talked about it. You know, I certainly had thought about living abroad in different places a few times, like uh, right out of graduate school, I considered moving to Singapore for a teaching position there. When I was even younger, in my early 20s, I had spent some time in Europe and I considered going there to sort of find a career. And so I'd always been attracted by the thought of living abroad. And then because of my girlfriend and later wife being from Shanghai, it was something that we actively talked about. But in some ways, it always came down to the practical of wondering how to do it, right? Career-wise, how to do it. Is it something where you, you find a job and then you go? Or is it something where you just throw yourself in and then see what happens? So in 2020, an opportunity came, I think. You joined the faculty of Shanghai Jiao Tong University's Institute of Cultural and Creative Industry. So could you tell us the story behind your decision to take on that new role in China? My wife were looking for opportunities in Shanghai. Institute of Cultural and Creative Industry began in 2015. I became aware of it later, probably 2017, 2018, and uh, started talking to them about possibilities. We tried to put together a way that we could make it work, looking at national recruitment awards and different awards and ways that I could come here at kind of a senior position that would make sense coming from the Art Institute of Chicago and I was a senior faculty there in the design department and department chair mm -hmm. after that. And so beginning around 2018, we started to try to put together a way for me to come here, be a part of the institute. And then things also changed over that period of time. Like my wife and I had a son. And so we wanted to move here more because of our son would have grandparents here in the city in Shanghai. And so that became a new reason to move to Shanghai as well. And so we we're just finally able to put it all together in 2020. In the meantime, also, like all of the COVID stuff happened. Yeah. So we had already putting it together starting 2018. But by the time it really came around, a lot of things had changed. It took a lot of work to make it happen. And we wound up moving here at the end of July 2020. At that time, the U.S. had experienced a little bit of lockdown and then it was easing up a little bit in the summer. And uh, it was just possible at that moment. We left very quickly. We packed everything up in three days and moved just uh, very quick because we saw an opportunity. And it was wonderful. You know, I mean, as it worked out, we were able to be in Shanghai, which has been quite a, an open city during the time, which has been really good. I think we've been really grateful for that because our son has been able to go to school and to go to events and go to the park and play and not have to experience some of these pains of lockdown. Could you tell us your daily routine as a teacher working for the Shanghai Jiao Tong University? I'm working on the Min Hong campus, mm -hmm. but I'm living in Xu Hui, near the Xu Hui campus. So there's quite a large commute. <laughs> it's very far away from <laughs> Xu Hui, right? I mean, Hong mm -hmm. campus is a good bit farther south. Yeah. So there's a commute. The ICCI program is a graduate program. So I'm working with graduate students and especially with students in the new Master of Fine Arts program that's just begun a year and a half ago. 
I'm advising a set of students, but I'm also teaching a few classes in new media technology and just helping develop this program and all the new classes. Quite a few collaborations with different international schools. Ours is a collaboration with the University of Southern California, and it's an international group of faculty, and it's a group of students that are interested in international education, especially media. So it's a nice international group with ties outside. As an experienced filmmaker and artist, how do you encourage your students to do creative works using new media technologies? It's always true for university arts education is that this transition from undergraduate to graduate studies can be a real transition for students because undergraduate they're used to working sort of within the classes within assignments and then graduate they have to make their own projects and in some ways come up with the ideas themselves and be creative that's typical and true for a lot of different schools and it's true where we are and so there's this first year of trying to get them to be confident around developing their own ideas with this idea of in a sense working for yourself so instead of working for the teacher or working for the assignment you're working on your own project and then something that's particular to new technology that's i think quite tricky for universities is just that it changes universities are kind of good at things that don't change so you know you teach graphic design print design the same way that it was taught in Switzerland 90 years ago or something like that, <laughs> right? Universities are very good at that, right? You can teach literature and you teach the same book that you were taught when you were a student 40 years ago. But with new technology, it's just impossible in a few different ways. One is the actual technology itself is going to change every three, four years really fast, right? So mm -hmm. you just not even use the same tools that you were using three or four years ago. When I was a student, you know, I had a class in PHP and I had a class in linear video editing and I had one class in digital video editing and that was what was available in 2004 and 2005. But there were certainly no classes in apps and smartphones because there were no smartphones at all. So you have to write these classes yourself and you have to develop ideas about, well, what is the fundamental idea? What do they need to know if the technology is going to change in three years and maybe everything's going to change in 10, 15 years? This is very challenging for university because that's not the typical situation of a university. And it takes some creativity. You know, how do you get from an idea all the way to the audience? Some of that really stays the same. And this can be one of the real foundational things that you're teaching students that you're doing in these classes. What kind of works or projects have you been creating or getting involved in Shanghai right now? I've been putting together partnerships here in Shanghai, talking with the Shanghai Library and their archives, also Visual China Group as a major image rights holder, as well, there's a great local company here in Shanghai that does research around neighborhood history called Shanghai Urban Archaeology. And they're kind of a wonderful group of historical researchers here. And working with them around what sort of images are there available of the city, what international archives are there, which does a lot of those too of Shanghai history, and what sort of stories might people be interested in. You know, in some ways, just as a starting point, been developing some projects, practically developing projects along the famous set of buildings on the Bund. Right now, we're looking at VR projects, VR publications of an experience just along the Bund and Nanking Road, because there's a really great wealth of photographs from the past hundred years and a little bit more of that area and matching those up with locations there and stories that can be told about those locations. So it's a place to start in this, you know, a big city. There's a lot of different projects you can imagine doing in Shanghai, but this is a place where we've started. And I hope over the next six months to start publishing different VR experiences of those sites and expand out from there. China is home to extremely rich cultural heritages. I think there is a vast trove of paintings in ancient China. So do you think new media technologies such as VR and AR a good way to bring those heritages to life and make them relatable to us today. If you go to the big national museums, 
you tend to see these large scrolls, right? Scroll paintings yeah. of landscape. Like this is a big part of pictorial history. I mean, there's many other things, but this is one, right? It's always seemed very clear to me that they present a kind of special challenge for creating experiences of them because they're hard to see in a way because of their scale, because you can't let people touch them. You know, they can sort of be displayed on walls or displayed in long glass cases. But there's a, a frustration with the scale because you're looking at this very long strip of paper. But what's being portrayed is mountains and huge landscapes, yeah. right? But it looks very small. It's just in this little glass case and you're maybe like two meters away from it. And so there's this frustration going on of how you want to see it and how you're able to see it. Scrolls, not 360, right? But they are panoramic big areas of landscape or scenes or narrative scenes or different types of things. They deal with space and time in unusual ways. And so it's occurred to me that these might present a special opportunity for media technology. If you look at one of these scrolls and maybe it shows 10 different pieces of time, right? Because it's a story. And so there's different things that are happening. And then it also shows 15 different directions because it's looking around in different places and maybe moving around. How could you do this in media? How could you make yeah. this into a media experience that yeah. someone could look around, but also be immersed in it, right? Immersed in this landscape, this historical landscape, and maybe even connect it to present day China. How do you prepare for making VR and AR productions using these Chinese resources? What kind of things do you do to inform yourself, to educate yourself about Chinese culture and Chinese history? I'm never going to be the expert on anything. And so finding people to work with in the museums, finding historians to work with who are the expert in those stories or these particular things. I think the other one is that content is king in a way, in mm -hmm. the sense that whatever it is that we have historically, it's not going to change. You can't get new things, right? I mean, you can find new things. What's actually there in the image? What does the image give you? What possibilities does it give you? And really paying attention to the content itself and what's possible. What's your observation of the development and application of the VR and AR landscape in both the United States and China? VR is quite an active area right now. It doesn't mean that I know necessarily where it's going, but commercially it's quite active still. It's grown a lot over the past 10 years, and China has a real active role in that. Chinese distributors for VR are doing quite a good job, and they're very active. AR is a little different in that it hasn't totally figured itself out yet. You know, it seems like it's always emerging, but it's never quite emerged. And I think that's true in the U.S. and here. There's a lot of expectation, especially coming out of Meta or Facebook and the money they've put in in the U.S. To try to develop augmented reality and connect it with virtual reality. But it hasn't really moved yet. And here, I don't know if there's any real big players moving in it yet. But maybe it's coming by dance and WeChat and things like that are going to move more aggressively into AR I think we're wondering more about bigger experiences connected with gaming or cinema or theater or these sort of things. And I think it's going to be probably five years before we see much real movement there. And then maybe we're going to see what the next thing is. Do you have any plans for you and your family? I really look forward to travel opening up again, you know, travel without quarantine. I, <laughs> I hope that happens soon because... We used to travel a lot, you know, consistently every year, and uh, I miss it an awful lot. There's something very wonderful about travel. And it tends to be something nice about academic careers. There's connections internationally, and there's reasons to travel. So I hope that that opens back up. What are some fun things you do in your spare time? I certainly play around with new technology a lot. So I'll get these new types of cameras or new types of viewers and just do little projects with them or make little things mm -hmm. um, to try to see what's possible or just to play with them. I guess, you know, I'm kind of looking forward to my son getting a little bit older and maybe being able to do that with him, you know, as he becomes interested in these things. And so maybe it could become a family thing as well. So your hobby is still work-related? Yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, how about learning Chinese? I've been taking lessons since I got here. It's about finding a certain number of hours <laughs> to put into it, right? And I wish I could put in more hours, but I hope 
over a long period of time, I'll be able to make some real progress. All the best to you. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, Jeffrey, thanks for talking to me. Thank you. Thanks for the interest. With that, we conclude this edition of Footprints. I'm Tony Reed. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.